the attitude. I, I tell my kids, um, kind of jokingly, kind of not, quite often, that their mom is never wrong. And even when she's wrong, she's right. That's what I tell them. I tell them, my kids, I say, listen, your mom is always right. If she says something, I'm going to go with it. Partially because she's actually really smart. She's right here and she's amazing. Um, she's really smart. She's like got a double major. She's like one of these computer programming people who knows everything. And when it comes to kids, she's way better than I am. And so I just tell my kids all the time, whatever your mom says, she's right. And if you ever prove to me she's wrong, I'm still thinking she's right. Now they know I'm kind of joking because every now and then Jen makes a minor mistake. I mean, we disagree sometimes. So of course, one of us has to be wrong, right? Usually it's not her. But um, so we, we have these this relationship in our family where the kids know I'm not telling them the entire story, but it's the real story as much as is possible, okay? Because we are their source for wisdom, and I want them to know that. Now, check this verse out. In Proverbs 13, 1, it says this, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, <clears throat> but a mocker does not listen to rebuke. So, of course, we can look at this verse and skim over it and say, well, if I had wise kids, they would pay attention to my instruction. Which, of course, leads me to the question, do you have wise kids? Are they paying attention to your instruction? If they're not paying attention, then something of the wisdom is missing that we need to get. So that's one of the reasons why we're going through Proverbs here, to try to get some of this wisdom out. But there's one other thing I want to say before we move on to the rest of this, and it's that some of you have had fathers who gave bad instruction. And in many cases, we actually in most cases, we've had some bad instruction from some of our parents. And I'm not saying that you have to pay attention to everything that they say in the terms of doing it. But that verse says, a wise son heeds which means listens to, understands, desires to learn, then, depending on the age of the kid and the maturity of the kid, processes and lives by. Do you understand? A wise son heeds his father's instruction. Okay, what I want to do is I want to give you this recipe of how to get wisdom into your kids. And it comes from three principles about wisdom found in Proverbs. And here's the first one. Number one, wisdom starts with fearing the Lord. Wisdom starts with fearing the Lord. All these verses will be on the screen, but if you want to mark them up on your note sheet there, that would probably be pretty good. Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. Underline the word beginning. This is where it starts. If you want wisdom in your kids... At some point, before they can get any wisdom, they have to get this awareness that God is supreme over them. That they have life in relationship to their heavenly Father. Somehow we have to build that into them. Look at this next verse, Proverbs 14, 26. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. Check that out. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. The picture there is now, it's not about getting my kids to fear the Lord. I need to fear the Lord. Because in order for me to give my kids the kind of fortress in which they can grow up safely, in which they can discover what God's will for them is, I need to fear the Lord. Because if I fear the Lord, then I have this security and I have a fortress for my kids in which they can grow. You see, it's not about getting my kids to follow God. It's about me following God. One more verse here. Look at this. Proverbs 27. It says, The righteous man leads a blameless life. Blessed are his children after him. As your life walks with God... Your kids are blessed. Now, see, here's the thing. I'm convinced of this fact. In order to raise kids who honor the Lord, you have to honor the Lord. In order to raise kids who fear the Lord, 
you have to fear the Lord. In order to raise kids who obey the word, you have to obey the word. See, you can't tell a kid how to love by telling him to love. You, you can't say to a kid, no kid ever learns not to smoke by the parent saying, don't smoke. No kid ever learns not to damage their body by the parent saying, by the way, don't damage your body. No kid ever learns to be healthy by the parent saying, be healthy. It's always that the kid does what the kid sees. You follow me on that? So if, you know, I get this conversation from people quite often. Someone will call me up and they'll be like, do you guys have a kids program? I really want to get my kids in church. I really want my kids to grow up to know God. And I'm asking them the question, how is that possible? You know, I've got a, the, they will tell me they've got some 13 or 14 year old kid or sometimes even an 18 year old kid who's really off the deep end. He's made some huge mistakes in his life. He's gone downhill. He's in trouble with the law. He's been to the courts. He's almost going to jail. And the parent is like, oh my goodness, I need to do something to rescue my kid. And so they call me up and say, do you have a youth program? As if that's going to rescue their kids. And sometimes a youth program can rescue a kid. But, but the thing is that that kid is only doing what he saw in his parents all the time. They had a moderately careless view about God and so therefore does the child. If you've got young kids, this is your time. Not to train them, but to be it. Does that make sense? Because kids do what kids see. So that's the first one. The fear of the Lord is where wisdom starts. Flip the page over and let's go on to number two. The second one is that wisdom develops through discipline. Wisdom develops through discipline. There's some good verses here, okay? There's some really good verses here I'm going to share with you here. So let's look at the first one, Proverbs 29, 15. The rod of correction imparts wisdom. Did you know that wisdom travels from butt to brain? Just... Travels right in there. Okay, so my parents put a lot of wisdom into me that way. Um, the, the, way to a, the way to a child's head is through his butt. Um, so I, I was, I had, my parents actually followed this. We actually had a PVC rod that uh, my parents used because my dad was a pastor. He was being biblical. No, seriously. Um, they used that because we'd broken all the spoons in the house on our rear ends and, and the belts were just too floppy and difficult. But my parents had a rule, okay? Yes, they spanked us, but they had a very, very clear rule, okay? It goes like this. When some kid does something wrong, whether it's me or my sister, three swats and a hug. That's the way it always went. In fact, with my dad and me, I don't know what it was like with my sister, but with my dad, he often, instead of having me like bend over the bed and him whacking me or something like that, he often brought me into him and hugged me as he whacked, and the angles there are just difficult. So I'm sure he hit himself a few times. That's why he says, this hurts me more than it does you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, seriously, so I would be hugging my dad, and he'd give me three whacks, and that was it. Now, they hurt. Don't get me wrong. I cried. Don't get me wrong. The last time when it happened, I held it all in, but then I was 16, so I could. <laughs> and, and I'm not even joking about that. that that's serious. Um, I don't even remember what I did, but it must have been bad. So, but here's the deal. It says, a rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to himself disgraces his mother. Next week is Mother's Day. Now, in my family, we don't spank our kids. Partially, it's because my kids are perfect little angels. But partially, it's because I think um, Jen and I are from from families that have different parenting and discipline styles. And so it was easier for us to adopt her family's parenting style with regard to discipline than it was mine. But when my kids were really, really little and they reached for something, I, I would flick the back of Charlie's hand and be like, no, you don't touch that. Just, just a little flick, just to give a little bit of pain there. And um, so I'm not saying you have to spank. The key there is correction. And we'll get to discipline in just a little bit what that really means. But look at this next verse. 
Proverbs 13, 24, He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. If you don't discipline your kids, you hate them. Next one, Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your son, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. A lot of us fear discipline because we feel like we're hurting the kid. We're restricting the kid. We're taking away some of that kid's life. If we ground them, they can't have the fun. They might whine. They might fuss. We feel like we're taking something away. But here, this passage says, if you don't discipline, you are a party to their death. If they go do something stupid, if they go get, in, get themselves into a crazy accident because they were messing around with the wrong kind of crowd and they end up dying, you're a part of that because you didn't guide them appropriately. How to raise kids without killing them? It's not getting all uptight. It's not saying, oh my goodness, I, I need to find some way to discipline this kid because he's just driving me nuts. It's instead having a pattern of discipline that leads to a place where you don't get to that place where you're doing something you haven't previously decided to do. We'll cover that in just a couple minutes. We're getting there, okay? Proverbs 23, 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. I just like that line. If you punish your kid, it's not going to kill him. And then the last one, Proverbs 29, 17. Discipline your son and he will give you peace. He will bring delight to your soul. When Charlie was an infant, he would not sleep through the night. And um, we, we struggled with this. We really were, were worried about this. We thought, oh my goodness, his entire future is messed up because he's not sleeping through the night at eight months old. And, you know, because we were stressed out, so a couple more months passed, and eventually we went to the doctor and said, okay, can you tell us what's the deal with this? How do we get our son to sleep through the night? Because, um, you know, we're tired. It's making us frustrated. And here's the deal. She gave us a book. And in the book, it was a modified Ferber method. How many of you are familiar with like this Ferberizing of kids? You know, a couple of people are, especially the newest parents. They're all like, yeah, we've heard it. We've heard it. So, okay, so here's the deal with the, the concept of Ferbering your kid or, or, or Ferberizing them or whatever they're saying these days. Um, it's the guy who would put kids in bed and let them cry. Okay, because crying doesn't hurt them. Well, we read this book, and the book has this really strict method. So this is free parenting advice for any of you who have new, newborns or, or something like that. But it was a really strict method that goes like this. Number one, if your kid doesn't fall asleep easily, put them in bed earlier the next night. Put them in bed a half an hour earlier than the previous night until you get to the place where you can get them in their crib and they'll be quiet. But after you begin to figure out how early can we go, so for us, we had been putting Charlie in bed at like 9 o'clock, and then we eventually got to 7.30, I think. Might have been even earlier, maybe 7 o'clock. Was it earlier? Something like that. Anyway, so we, we would put him in bed, and then here's the second piece. You say to the kid, verbalize it, no matter how old the child is, you say, I'm putting you in bed, and I will be back in five minutes to check on you. And then you leave the room, regardless of their behavior, regardless of their screaming, you keep your promise. Five minutes, you come back. And you show up again, you say, it's been five minutes, are you doing okay? And you, you pat them on the back, you give them a little hug, maybe give them a little kiss and say, okay, it's time for bed, I'm going to leave, and in seven minutes, I'll come back. And in seven minutes, you better be back. But you do that, and then every time you say a bigger number, and then you keep your promise. And here's the deal. As the parent, you say what's going to happen, and you keep your promise, and the kid eventually learns, okay, when dad says he's going to do something, he does it. When mom says she's going to do something, she does it. Therefore, even though they're only nine months old, whatever, therefore, they begin to trust you. So that if you say, I'll be here in the morning, they'll believe that. Worked like magic on Charlie. I don't think it worked as well with Katie, but it worked like magic with one of our children. But here's the principle that I'm trying to get at. The principle is that proper discipline 